All right, so Madia, thank you so much for being here. This is Madia Lin. Uh, you are the executive director of, uh, I'm going to mispronounce the name, is it Masjid Al Rabia? Yep, you're good. Masjid good. Al Rabia. Awesome. Thanks. So, um, so you are the executive, executive director of this mosque in Chicago, which is an inclusive mosque. Um, thanks so much for being here with us. Could you uh, just introduce yourself? Tell us what pronouns you use, anything you want to say about yourself? Um, yeah, my name is Madia Lin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I run Masjid Arabia, which is a women-centered, LGBT-affirming, pluralist mosque here in the city of Chicago. We've been running since December of 2016. Um, so this will be our second Ramadan starting tomorrow, which I'm very excited about. That's so wonderful. I'm so excited and happy for you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you identify, uh, like how, in terms of your gender and your gender experience? Um, yeah, I will usually refer to myself as a woman of trans experience or just a trans woman. Uh -huh. um, as uh, someone who, like, I came out in transition when I was a teenager in the mid-2000s, um, so been around for a little while. <laughs> um, and I had, for a, a fair amount of time, um, decided to kind of go back in the closet and live stealth for many years uh, before um, I came back out of the closet in 2016. Mm. And um, uh, before then, I had been working, when I was younger, I worked as a... Uh, an organizer with Camp Trans um, back in the day. And then when I went kind of stealth, I worked from using a pen name and still did some like community organizing online. And then in 2016, I came out again and have been a uh, vocal advocate for transgender and gender diverse Muslims. Mm, yeah, that's a 2016 is a hard time to have gone through that coming out process again, but so needed also. Yeah, it was a lot. But um, at the end of the day, like, a lot of good has come from it. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about your faith background and kind of like your faith journey and how you came to where you are now? Um, yeah, I, uh, I came to Islam later in my life, in my mid-20s. Um, but it it feels like I have always been Muslim, mm -hmm. um, really since I was, um, since I really had a conception of faith and belief, um, those things had been pretty unchanging. Mm -hmm. um, and belief in what in Islam we call tawhid, like the, the, uh, the unity of things through Allah. Um, that when I started reading the Quran, it was like, um, It was like I was reading something that I already knew, and it just happened to be like laid out um, in like this perfect expression of the things that I had already known my entire life. Wow. Um, and so I had, uh, for a while, I was living a uh, very different kind of lifestyle. Mm. Um, and I struggled for a really long time with, um, with disability, with mental illness and addiction, and um, a lot of things that trans people can fall into because of the lack of resources that we have and just the society that we live in, mm -hmm. um, especially back then, wasn't very great. And so I fell into many of the traps that, that trans people can fall into and it ended up being um, Islam, which gave me my life back. Mm -hmm. um, and as I started to practice more, my life got easier and um, eventually it stopped being a struggle and I was able to thrive. Hmm. And so since then it had been, I see it as my, um, my responsibility to give back. If Islam has saved my life and given me a purpose in my life, then it, it's my job to return the favor and share Islam with others. Hmm. I love that, that's awesome. Um, this, uh, just sort of at my own curiosity, could you talk a little bit about um, like there, there are certain gender practices in every sort of major religion that seem to um, kind of 
help create community within people of that particular gender. And so I think a lot of times when people think of Muslim women, they also they often think about like wearing the hijab. Could you talk a little about like how that's been for you as a trans woman and like how that experience has been? Um, I think as a woman and especially as a transgender woman, um, our bodies are essentially public property mm. as like sites for consumption, as sites of dis like discussion and discernment. Um, so that for me, and I know a lot of other women feel similarly, it, um, to wear hijab or to observe um, covering the way that I do is a assertion that my body belongs to me mm. and is not um, not up for debate. It's not up to, for ownership, but anyone but between myself and Allah. Mm. And so um, it's funny that, that people try to use it as this like symbol of oppression and repression and and so many people have felt the need to try to to save me yeah. from from a scary Islamic practice. Um, it has been liberatory for me, mm -hmm. and it is a um, for me an assertion of ownership over my own body mm -hmm. and removing it from the public sphere. That's cool. That's a cool way of thinking about it. It's it's one of those things where like we don't afford that to, you know, Jewish men who wear a kippah or yarmulke, you know, like other sorts of things like that we don't do. But with Muslim women, that's something that people really harp on. So I wanted to ask you about that and, and get your thoughts on it. Um, could you speak a little bit about um, a any sort of like spiritual practice or maybe religious text that has meant something to you and kind of helped you in your um, experience? Um, Islam is an interesting tradition because we actually have um, historical and legal precedent for trans people and gender diverse people going all the way back to the time of the prophet, peace be upon him. Um, there were like gender diverse people, people we may interpret today as transgender who were lived like within the community and, and was even in the house of the prophet at times. Um, we know that there are other um, like gender diverse people who have existed from then well before then and all the way up through um, in the 80s and 90s there were uh, 1980s and 1990s. <laughs> um, we have high profile rulings from both Shia and Sunni traditions um, in support of trans people's prerogative to transition and be recognized within their true gender. Mm. And so we have an entire body of text and history and, and fic to look at and um, use to affirm our rights to exist. Cool. So that leads into my next question, which is what's, what's like one resource that you would suggest to, I guess, one resource that you would suggest um, if people wanted to learn more about the tradition, the legal tradition, and then is there like a, um, some sort of like hopeful sort of thing that you would recommend to a young trans Muslim person to like help them with their journey? Um, at Meshad Arabia, we are working right now on um, collating and putting together a lot of these resources because they are, um, like as I've done this work, I do like kind of on the ground advocacy for trans people, especially um, transgender Muslims who are incarcerated. Mm. And like I have driven to an institution to like and deliver these paper rulings. Um, we have to like do our own translation work for some pieces um, because it's all there. There's um, like I can attach a reading list to go with this. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Um, so we're working on, on collating things a lot, and there are a lot of good books out there. Um, I would recommend checking out mashararabia.org. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of resources for um, 
LGBT Muslims, and especially we do a lot of work with uh, trans Muslims. I mean, I'm the person, I'm, I'm in the person running it, mm -hmm. and um, so I mean, clearly we're going to be a like trans-centered organization. Right. You you walk the walk. You don't just talk the talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the beautiful thing is that, uh, like when we started, I was able to say that like I was the only trans woman in the global north or the western hemisphere that was running a mosque, okay. and where there was three of us, <laughs> and there was two people in um, in Indonesia and in Pakistan that that were running things but it was like the three of us and now that is changing um and there are spaces opening up kind of all over the place um and this is a community that has that is flourishing mm. right now in a moment this is a really beautiful moment for the movement because um it kind of feels like for the first time there really is an articulation of the movement that mm. there is this um, ongoing momentum towards justice and towards a uh, towards an Islam that leaves nobody behind, mm. and um, that's what Mashad Arabia is on the front lines doing um, through like education, advocacy, and outreach, trying to make change, and all of our services that we have, um, Jumma prayers every week, um, any of our special events that we have, um, everything can be accessed digitally. Wow. So no matter where you are, you can be a part of our, our community. That's great. Uh, and we are making sure that everything is um, as accessible as possible. We have live captioning and transcripts for, for anything that we can. Um, we make sure every venue that we're ever in is handicap accessible. Uh, we make sure um, everything that we do is free. Um, we, we try to remove ev as many barriers as we can to the work. So while there are these beautiful places that are popping up and communities that are being built across the world right now, um, if you don't have that yet, we're here. That's so wonderful. Well, I'll make sure that we've got links to um, Masjid Al Rabia's uh, webpage and then any resource list you want to send, I'll make sure that's attached as well. Um, can you speak a little bit about your experience observing Ramadan uh, since Ramadan just started and uh, people are kind of looking for resources to help them uh, and walk with them during this time? Yeah, definitely. We are in the middle of the moon wars right now, actually, because some people started observing Today's our first day fasting, and then some of us are just starting tomorrow. That's why I was getting conflicting reports. Okay, that makes yes. sense. Um, the science says that we have a moon, but um, no, across the whole world last night, there, there was no sighting mm. of a moon. Okay. Like one person saw it through a telescope, so mm -hmm. it, there's even more controversy. Right, about whether the telescope say counts. It's like naked eye. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually one of my favorite miniature traditions. That's very cool. The, um, our arguments over the date. <laughs> Not so much arguments, it's like the pluralism of it is mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. It's a fun thing to joke about. <laughs> um, that and Sunni Shia opinions on what time Maghreb is. Mm. Like the, the time that we break fast. Because mm -hmm. um, I practice Shia tradition, it's always like 15 minutes later than the Sunnis observe it. Mm. Um, so whenever I host an iftar at my home, we go by like my clock, like my house, house of, house of the prophet's rules. And so you can hear like everybody else's like azan apps go off uh -huh. and they know that like it's Maghreb. <laughs> so they're ready to eat. And yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you gotta wait like 12 minutes or so. <laughs> That's great. Just being extra careful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, um, ha how, like, what have been, like, the traditions around Ramadan and Iftar and, like, different, um, what are traditions that you really like and that mean a lot to you? Um, Ramadan is a very family-centered kind of holiday and practice. 
um, and there's a lot of like community bonding over experiencing fasting together and breaking fast and having all of these events. And so it's something that can be really difficult for, for queer and trans people because family is very fraught. But the, the most beautiful thing that's come out of it has been the chosen families that we have made and the, uh, the traditions that we've made together and the events that we hold. Um, the community here in Chicago is really phenomenal and has been really um, a, a source of strength for me for a long time. And uh, I really like, like I pray that everyone will be able to experience that. It's something that's hard when you're young and struggling with family and things like that. And so I, I ask you to kind of hold on, hold out, because that, that chosen family will come. And especially like the people that I know, like the, the queer and trans people, the trans and gender diverse people especially, who have ended up coming together over the years. The family that we built is one of the most like, beautiful things I could have been blessed with. Cool. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, I'm really excited for everybody to see this and to um, have it as something that they can look to when they're feeling like there's nobody out there because there are people out there and this is great. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, we'll hopefully talk to you more later. Right, sounds good. As-salamu alaykum. Thanks